Luke chapter 8, beginning at verse 43. We're going to read today through verse 48. Luke chapter 8, verses 43 through 48. I read today from the King James text. And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him, meaning Jesus, and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good courage, excuse me, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Hallelujah. I want to talk to us today for a while on the topic, Never Too Late for a Miracle. Amen. Never Too Late for a Miracle. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, King Jesus, Master, Savior, Redeemer of lost men. We love you and we thank you for the presence of the Holy Ghost that we have felt in the house of God today as we sing the great old songs of the church that remind us we don't have long to stay here. We don't have long to wait. And that's all right with me because this old world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Lord, the word of God must go forth at this hour. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost if we're to be effective. The preached Word of God can accomplish great things in the lives of God's people when they receive it gladly. And we ask God today that the Holy Ghost would go before us, that you would till up the soil, that you would soften the hard ground and prepare the earth of every man and woman's heart that would hear this message, Amen. that they might be able to receive it, that it might bear fruit in their lives Amen. unto righteousness for your name's sake. We ask it all, Master, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise amen. God and amen. I want to tell you today, we often lose out on miracles in our lives simply because we give up too soon. <laughs> when the doctors have spoken the last word, or we've spent our very last dime, we often arise, uh, excuse me, arrive at the place of desperation. There is nowhere else to go. There's no other source to tap. There is no other avenue to pursue. All we are left with is the hope of a miracle. Oh, hallelujah. And then Jesus walks by. Hallelujah. Then Jesus shows up on the scene. And that miracle is made available to us. Amen. If only we can believe. In John chapter 9, we read of a man who was born blind. Chances are this man had long ago given up any hope of ever being able to see. But Jesus passed by and gave him an opportunity for a miracle. Making mud from dirt and spittle, the Lord wiped this on the man's eyes and then instructed him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Notice, this man could have been disgusted who wouldn't be disgusted by someone spitting 
in dirt in their hand, mixing it together to make a little bit of mud, as it were, and then wiping it on your eyes, on your eyelids. Can you imagine? Who wouldn't be disgusted? This man could have been disgusted. He could have run to the nearest well or basin of water to clean this mud from his eyes. But instead, he obeyed the Lord's command. Hallelujah. Amen. And he did as he was instructed. The result of this was that he came away from the pool of Siloam seeing glory to God. Sometimes the Lord will speak to us Amen. in our desperation and instruct us to do something which may seem impractical or unnecessary. But right. obedience is the evidence of faith. Listen to me, children. Obedience is the evidence of faith. Amen. You can say you have faith, James said in James chapter 2, till the cows come home. But until you act on that faith, until right. you Amen. put action to that faith, then your faith is mute. It, it means nothing. It's Amen. meaningless. I'm going to tell you, if God lays something on your heart, the Lord speaks to your spirit to do something. Mm -hmm. You are a fool not to do it. Amen. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I learned that lesson a long, long, long time ago. <laughs> when God spoke to me at the age of 16 years old, I had never visited Texas, didn't know anything about Texas, never had been here, never, not one time. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me when I was 16 years old barely 16, and said, I want you to go to Texas. That's what he told me. He said, I'm going to train you for your ministry. That's going to be your training ground for your ministry, is this trip to Texas. And I said, Lord, Texas? My God, I don't hardly even know anybody in Texas. The only people I know in Texas are my great aunt and my great uncle and their kids, my cousins. But I didn't even know them real well either because my great aunt would come up from Texas to Connecticut where I grew up. Every summer she'd come up, you know, she hated, she, she grew up in New England and she hated the Texas heat. So she would take the summers to come up to Connecticut and visit family and what have you. And we have family all over Connecticut and all over the Massachusetts, Cape Cod area. And so she'd come up and she'd stay with my grandparents, her sister and brother-in-law. And then she'd travel around to Massachusetts and visit family, you know, and spend time. And she would would literally spend the whole summer up here uh, visiting. So I knew her, and I'm going to tell you, she had a reputation of being a real hard cookie. <laughs> She, she wasn't the friendliest woman in the bunch. She was Pentecostal. She was Pentecostal holiness. But she wasn't the softest person, especially with kids. Oh, she could be real hard on the kids. And here I am, God telling me, go to Texas. Well, I didn't know how I could go about doing it except to call my great aunt and ask her if I might come down and stay with her a while. I said, eventually I'll try to get myself a place, rent a room or something. But in the meantime, would it be okay if I came down and stayed with you? And she said, yeah, sure, come on down. She was always happy for family to go down to Texas, you know. Mm -hmm. So I decided to obey God. I was working at a grocery store as a checker at the time. And I made the money and I bought myself a plane ticket. Let me tell you something else. I was terrified of flying. I don't mean I was afraid of flying. I mean I was terrified of flying. I, ever since I was a kid, I always had this horrible, horrible aversion to heights, you know, I, I was terrified of heights. And the idea of flying in a plane scared the life out of me. Mm -hmm. But God had instructed me to go to Texas. See, this is what I don't understand about people when they claim God's told them something, and then they have every excuse under the sun for why they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the Lord instructed me to go to Texas, but bless God, I'm terrified of flying. Well, then take a bus. 
Amen. There's more than one way to get to Texas. You don't have to fly. But I wanted to get there as quick as I could get there. I didn't feel like sitting on the bus for 28 hours or however long it took. I, I wanted to get there in a few hours, you know, so I said, I'm going to fly. I said, listen, if God called me to Texas, He ain't going to let me go down in a plane crash. Amen. If the Lord wants me in Texas, then honestly, everybody on that plane ought to thank God I'm on that plane. Because Amen. the fact I'm on that plane guarantees it's going to get where it's going. Hallelujah. Amen. Because God wants me somewhere and He's going to make sure I get there. Hallelujah. Amen. See, that's faith when we act on. Mm -hmm. When we act on what God has spoken and what the Lord has instructed us. I acted on it. I bought the plane ticket. I got on the plane. I flew to Texas. I had a terrible, horrible facial tick. Mm -hmm. it, really, it was a nervous condition. Ever since I was eight years old, I had this horrible, terrible facial tick condition. And I could not control it. It was totally involuntary. The muscles in my neck and my head would jerk. And it was terrible. Some people thought I might have Tourette's Syndrome. But I didn't scream out curses. That was the only thing that people with Tourette's do that I didn't do. But I had these terrible tics. And I had had them through my entire youth from 8 till 16. Here I am, 16. I go to Texas. I get off the plane and uh, my aunt takes me on the way. She said, are you hungry? We can stop at Denny's and get something to eat. So we stopped at Denny's and we're sitting at Denny's and my aunt looks at me and she said, CJ, now I went to Texas in February uh, now you all can do the math, find out how old the preacher is. I went to Texas at the age of 16 in February of 82. February 12th, 1982. I'll never forget that day as long as I live. My aunt had just left Connecticut back in August. So it hadn't been six months since she'd seen me, right? Right. And she's looking at me kind of funny, and I'm looking back at her kind of funny. Why is she looking at me so funny? <laughs> And finally, she says to me, CJ, stands for Chuck Jr., says, CJ, when did your facial tics and your nervous condition go away? And I looked at her and I said, well, it hasn't that I know of. She said, I've been watching you ever since you got off the plane. You have not one time demonstrated a facial tic. There's not been one single movement not one single involuntary movement since you got off the bus. I said, what? And I literally jumped up out of my seat at Denny's and ran to the restroom. Brother, I want to tell you. And I sat there and I looked in the mirror. For eight years, I'd struggled with this. For eight years, I'd been going through this. Mm -hmm. And I looked in the mirror and I sat there for literally about at least maybe five to ten minutes just looking at myself in the mirror, just looking. And I was waiting to see if something was going to happen and nothing happened. I'm 56. That was 40 years ago. Got news for you. It never came back. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, when God speaks to us, it is imperative. It is to our benefit that we act in faith and obey Him. Hallelujah. If He says go and wash in the pool of Siloam, then don't go to another pool. Go to the pool of Siloam. Hallelujah. Whatever He instructs you to do, do it. Amen. Because God doesn't speak just to hear His own voice. All things work together for good to them that love God. To them that are the called according to His purpose. Glory to God. I want to tell you this little woman in our primary text today had wrestled with an issue of blood for 12 years. The Word of God does not articulate what her condition was. Interestingly enough, where this story is shared with us through the Apostle Luke, who by reason of his vocation was a doctor. So if anybody understood medical things to the best of their knowledge at that time, Luke understood medical things. And this woman came to Jesus with a condition that she had dealt with for 12 years. She used every 
dime she had trying to find an answer through the various doctors and physicians in her community and she came up empty but then Jesus was coming by and she had a thought, if maybe if I can just touch the hem of his garment. In her desperation, she decided, I'm going to turn to the Lord and see if God can't do this for me. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, 12 years is a long time. Mm -hmm. Eight years for this boy struggling with a nervous condition that made me the, the joke of my town. Made, I was uh, laughed at and I was bullied and I was made fun of growing up as a kid for eight solid years because of this condition I had. To this day, I still remember one particular neighbor that we had when I was young and a comment he made to me about my condition and it was a vulgar nasty comment I couldn't repeat it in church it wouldn't be appropriate but you know he said you know what my mother said causes you to do all that and he said something and it was just vulgar and nasty and here I am 56 years old and I still rose remember I still remember that comment because it was so hateful and so hurtful that I, ju I just can't forget it. I want to tell you, eight years is a long time. Going through what I've been going through in ministry for the last 30 years. Oh my God, I thought eight years was a long time. Let me tell you, 30 years, way, 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 way longer than eight years. I thought I could never do it. See, one of the problems we have is we think sometimes that we know the mind of God. We know the will of God. I know people who are asking God to do one thing. And when the Lord doesn't do that one thing, they get angry and upset with them. Well, I've been asking the Lord for this. And I've been telling the Lord I need Him to do this. And I think to myself, based on my own experience, I think to myself, well, are you in there anywhere? Are you reconsidering that maybe His will is different for you? Instead of asking God for a new job, maybe He wants you to ask Him for help to do the one you're in. My Lord, do you hear what I'm telling you now? Amen. Amen. Maybe Amen. He wants you to ask Him. Maybe He wants you where you're at for a reason. Maybe where you're at, you can be a testimony. Maybe where you're at, you can be a witness. Maybe where you're at, you might be able to lead somebody to Jesus who otherwise will never know Him. Maybe where you're at is where the Lord wants you to be. And the whole time you're fighting God because you feel like you can't be there. And the Lord is saying, why don't you ask me to help you do this job? Amen. If I'm not making a way for you to do something else, then maybe it's because I want you here. Amen. But we don't think like that, do we, a lot of times? No. no. When God didn't do what we think the Lord should be doing, and we, we reason it out with the Lord, Lord, now, you know, here's all my reasons for why you need to do this my way. Oh my goodness. I want to tell you today from personal experience, Rose, it's never too late for a miracle. Hallelujah. Twelve years may have seemed a long time, but God gave her a miracle anyway. Hallelujah. This man born blind, he was born blind. We don't know how old he was. He might have been 18. He might have been 80. We don't know. But whatever the length of time, surely he had given up on any hope of being able to see. Amen. But then the miracle came. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's never too late for a miracle. In, the, in Luke, the first chapter, verses 5 through 13, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass 
that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, listen, this last line is important. The angel said unto him, fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, the writer, once again, Luke, refers to Zacharias and Elizabeth as being, quote, well stricken in age. Surely any opportunity for a miracle had passed. They were too old at this point to even think of having a baby. But God had different plans. While they had lived so much of their lives hoping and praying for offspring, but to no avail, the miracle they had long prayed for, but had likely given up on, was now upon them. Oh, hallelujah. It's never too late for a miracle. Right. Sometimes Amen. our miracles, oh glory, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> Ooh, glory to God, sometimes our miracles are delayed. It is not, listen to me children, it is not that they are not forthcoming, but only set aside for a specific moment in time. God had a purpose for the son that Zacharias and Elizabeth were to have. Their child would make history. Their child would be spoken of for millennium to come. Amen. Their child would usher in the arrival of the very son of the living God. Hallelujah. Amen. But he who sees the end from the beginning and knows us before we are even born has a purpose and a plan even while we are waiting. Oh Amen. my goodness, have mercy. <sighs> Would we rather have a son now who does little and makes no mark in history? Or would we willingly wait for a miracle child in our later years who will shake up the world? Mm. And become forever a prominent and key figure in the very Word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh my God, don't you see? Yeah. Oh hallelujah, don't you see, folks? Amen. God was not punishing Zacharias and Elizabeth. God wasn't putting them through the ringer to try to punish them or because they didn't do something right. The Word of God said, in God's eyes, they did everything right. Amen. So it didn't have nothing to do with whether they were doing right or doing wrong. It didn't have anything to do with whether they were failing God or not failing God. Or whether they were keeping the commandments or they weren't keeping the commandments. No, no, no. They were just fine. They were perfect in God's sight. However, Amen. however, God had a plan. These people are so good, I, I want to reward them, actually. I want to do something special for them. So while you're waiting, oh my God, hallelujah, thinking Amen. that you're on punishment for some reason, God is saying, oh, no, no, no. God is saying, no, honey, no, no, no. I want to reward you. But to reward you, i got to hold it back a little bit because what I'm going to do takes timing. Right, it's all about timing. 
See, Messiah ain't coming yet, so I gotta wait a while. John is John. I'll let John be conceived six months before Jesus, but that's how the time it has to work. Amen. Mm -hmm. John can't be four years older. John can't be fifteen years older. John can't be twenty years older. I want John to come immediately preceding the Messiah. Amen. Now I could go into the Jewish calendar and I could help you to understand that if you know when it is that John was born, John the, the Jewish calendar is, is broken up into seasons, but not summer, spring, winter, and fall, spiritual seasons. John was born in the season of repentance. What was John's message? Repentance. Right. See, God, everything Amen. God does, everything God does, He does for a reason. Amen. Everything. <clears throat> Jesus was born in another season, six months later. What season was Jesus born? Jesus was born in the season of redemption. Amen. Hallelujah. Right. So you see, there was a purpose in John being born six months prior to Jesus because each of them were to be born in the season of the purpose of their ministry. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> oh, I want to tell you, just because you're waiting, just because it's taken a while, don't give up on believing God for a miracle. Don't give up on believing that God is able and secondly, that God is willing Amen. to do for you what you need Him to do. No, Zacharias and Elizabeth were rewarded for their many years of faithfulness Amen. and their many years of righteous, godly living. They were rewarded. Oh my. But they had to wait until they were in their old age. I don't know how many times I've thought, Lord, I've been trying to do this affirming ministry now for 30 years. How long are you going to make me wait? My God have mercy. I don't know if I can wait much longer. Look at me. I'm, I'm going to be an old man for too long. Well, I'll tell you, I've got more health issues that have come at me in the last 10 years than I had collectively my entire life. A lot of them, Brother Bill, are hereditary. A lot of the conditions I have, you know, my grandparents had, and it you know, comes down through the family of the... the uh, thyroid and you know diabetes and all this all this foolishness is in my bloodline you know I, it, the older you get it's going to happen in other words you know these these aren't punishments from God they're not it's nothing special I'm just experiencing what people experience as they get older but I sometimes say Lord have mercy how long are you going to make me wait Jesus I'm telling you you make me wait too long by the time I, I, I see the, the reality of what I'm believing you for, a church, a church full of people that love God, a church full of people know how to worship, know how to pray, know how to live right, know how to walk right and talk right and know how to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost and know how to worship in spirit and in truth. Lord, by the time that we have a church like the church that I've envisioned in my spirit, I'm going to be an old man. And then I have to step back sometimes and say, well, so be it. Mm -hmm. Would I rather wait? Would I rather wait till I'm an older man and God allows us to have what I've been waiting for all these years? Or would I try to rush it and try to have something now and compromise my ministry and compromise my message yeah. to try to make something happen that isn't quite yet in God's timetable? Amen. I think of a rather famous man. Most of us at one time or another eat or have eaten that Kentucky Fried Chicken. The founder of Kentucky Fried Chicken was a man named uh, Harlan Sanders. And they used to call him Colonel Sanders. You see the character on their advertisements, you know. Try, yeah, try a man trying to look like old Colonel Sanders with his white hair and his little goatee, you know, and all that, and his white suit. But you know, the interesting thing about Harlan Sanders is Harlan Sanders operated just a little diner in his town for years and years and years. And he made a living, you know, he made out all right. He's able to support his family and make his house payments and do what he had to do. 
But then all of a sudden, he was in his 60s. And he come up with this idea, what if I opened a restaurant and instead of having this variety menu where you've got all these different dishes and all these different things to offer, he said, what if I focused expressly on fried chicken? And if fried chicken were our primary offering. And you know, we just sold fried chicken and sides. He said, what if we did that? I wonder how that would take off. Well, he opened him a restaurant, and man, I'm telling you what, people loved it. When they were in the mood for fried chicken, they knew exactly where to go. They didn't need a restaurant that served 500 different items on the menu. They, they knew where to go when they wanted fried chicken. And so, all of a sudden, he decides, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make this into a franchise offering. And he offered it as a franchise, and pow, that thing blew up, and guess what? what in Colonel Sanders 60s he was all of a sudden a multi 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 millionaire all the success in the world had evaded him had eluded him until he was in his mid 60s and then all of a sudden bam here it comes I want to tell you something. That man was able to live large, as they say. He was able to live well for many years because he lived quite a number of years after. You know, one of the wonderful things about the Lord is if He makes you wait till you old to give you that blessing and that miracle that you've been waiting for and praying for and hoping for, He also is able to give you a long life so you have a long time to enjoy it. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Right. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. That miracle you're waiting on, let me tell you, that ain't the only thing God's able to do. Glory! He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we might ask or think. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. We seldom know God's timetable. We seldom understand the timing of the Lord. But he who sees the end from the beginning and knows us before we are even born mm -hmm. has a purpose and a plan. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. In John chapter 11, when the Lord showed up at the grave of Lazarus, four days following his burial, no one anticipated a miracle. <laughs> the time for miracles was now long past. The grave was sealed and the body was surely already in decomposition. But little did the mourners realize that the God who had created Lazarus in his mother's womb was walking among them. Hallelujah! Amen. And that his word, even the deadest of dead things, must rise and walk again in newness of life. Hallelujah! Martha acknowledged what she believed the Lord. Listen to me, children. She acknowledged what she believed the Lord. Lord could have done. <laughs> she said, oh Lord, if only you'd have been here sooner. Lazarus would still be alive. <laughs> oh Lord, you could have healed him. And the Lord reminded her, I'm the resurrection and the life, honey. I could have healed him, and I still can raise him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. I'm here to tell you today, whatever you're going through, whatever your struggle, whatever the trial that you're experiencing at this moment, it's never too late for a miracle. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, God could have done something yesterday. Yeah, he could have done something different yesterday. But I got news for you. He's still able to do something different today. Amen. Glory Amen. to God. Amen. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Right. It's never too late for a miracle. Right. My God, have mercy. Little did the mourners realize that Jesus was about to do something miraculous. She did not, Martha, that is, did not realize what the Lord could do yesterday Listen to me now. 
He could do better today. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. What the Lord could have done yesterday, He can do better today. Amen. Why? Well, it's going to take a bigger miracle today. Well, that's all right because God is just as capable of a bigger miracle as He is a big miracle. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, my God, have mercy. You never get to the point where your need is bigger than God's capability. It's not a matter of the worse things get. The less likely a miracle will occur. But rather it is the worse it gets, the bigger the miracle we need. Hallelujah. Amen. Thankfully our God is a God of big miracles. Hallelujah. Amen. As well as small miracles. I remember I've told this story so many times. Some of y'all probably tired of hearing it. Well that's tough because I'm going to tell you I lived through this and it was a miracle from from God, and I'm going to keep sharing it till Jesus comes because that's what we're supposed to do when God does something wonderful for us. Aren't Amen. We? Amen. In 2000, uh, I had been sick for about a year and a half or so, and uh, slowly I was losing weight. I was having an awful hard time. Uh, it got worse and worse over the course of a year and a half. And uh, I began to experience, to be frank, diarrhea uh, at a rate that was just terrible. I could not keep food in my body for more than a few minutes, literally. I would eat something, uh, Bill, and then a few minutes later I'd have to go to the restroom. And what I ate would literally come out of me, and it looked just the way it was in my mouth. Chewed up and all, but not digested at all beyond that. And the doctors could not figure out what was going on. They could not figure out why this was happening to me. They did every test. I lived in New York City. You would think I had the best medical attention available in the world to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had gone to doctor after doctor. I'd been to intestinal doctors. I'd been to this kind of doctor and that kind of doctor. And none of them could isolate what the problem was. Finally... Toward the end of 1999, I decided I was going to leave New York City, and I, I said, uh, I think I'm going to move back to Connecticut, where I'm from, because I'm not sure. I've been praying and praying and praying for the Lord to heal me. I kept praying for God to heal me. I kept praying for the Lord, and He wasn't healing. And I was getting worse by the day. So finally I decided, I said, well, Lord, if I wind up dead, I don't want to wind up dead in New York. I don't have anybody here in New York City. My family is terrified of New York City. The only folks who would come to New York were family I had who would come because I lived there, you know, and I could show them around if they felt safe with somebody they knew showing them around. But if I was dead, I wasn't going to show nobody nothing. And, and nobody in my family was going to feel like coming to New York City to identify my body or claim my body or anything. So I said, I'm going to move back to Connecticut. And that way, if things don't improve, if God doesn't touch me and heal me, and if I wind up going home, well, then I'll be where my family can easily, you know, retrieve my body. And I have a a burial plot reserved already that I paid for up there in my hometown. And I said, that way my family can easily dispose of my body and all that. I'm a very practical thinking person. Right. Well, I moved back to Connecticut. I was there January 2000. I moved back to Connecticut, first of the year. And there I am getting sicker and sicker. By that summer... I wound up in the hospital three times over the course of that singular summer. Mind you, there was a fellow in Connecticut who had asked me, said, Brother, if you ever leave New York, would you think about starting a work in Connecticut? He said, I'll come and I'll support you. I'll be there to support you. A young gay man. And his name is Harry, and I honor Harry, and I appreciate Harry. Because I'm going to tell you something about that boy. He kept his word. He kept his word. I went to Connecticut. I was sick as a mule, but I said, I'm going to work till Jesus comes. Sick or not sick, I'm going to work for the Lord till Jesus comes. So we started a little work. We started having meetings in a motel there in New Haven, Connecticut. 
We were having a wonderful time, having good meetings. The Spirit of the Lord was moving, but I wasn't getting better. Sometimes we wonder, Lord, I don't understand. I've been in some good Holy Ghost services. I've been in places where I should have walked out healed. I should have walked out bitter, but I didn't. Why, Lord? Why the wait? Yeah. God's whispering in her ear, because it's never too late for a miracle. Amen. I got sicker and sicker. I wound up in the hospital three times over the course of that summer. Each time I was there for a Sunday and I told the doctors, I said, I'm going to get out on Sunday because I got a little church with just a handful of people, but I won't preach. And I'm not going to miss church. And they said, well, we can't do that. You know, you need to stay here and be hooked up to the IVs and all. I said, no, sir. I said, I'll sign myself out AMA, but I won't preach because God called me to preach. And so they would come in, the nurses' rows come in, they'd unhook the IVs and all that. I'd put them under my shirt, I'd go to church, I'd preach, I'd come back, throw my guts up, lay down in the bed, and, uh, you know, put my hospital gown back on. I did that three times during the summer of 2000. One day, this old preacher, I grew up old time Pentecost, I don't play this thing. This ain't a game to me. The Bible said, they that wait upon the Lord, meaning they that do the Lord's bidding. Right. Wait on the Lord. Not wait as in stand still and do nothing. Wait as in what a waiter does. Right. A waiter don't stand still. No, he's constantly moving. He's got, Why? Because he's there to wait on you. When the Word of God said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, it literally means they that wait on Him that are doing His bidding. Amen. So I claim that promise. I said, Lord, you said they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Well, you called me to preach, so I'm going to preach. And if I have to get out of the hospital on Sunday morning so I can go preach and come back and lay right back down in this hospital bed, then that's what I'm going to do, and that's what I did. Still got worse. Still got worse. Still got worse. Finally, in August, we actually had us a little camp meeting. Not one of my preacher friends or anybody I had invited to come help us listen to me, not one of them showed up. I was sick as the mule. I was struggling just to live. I was starting to have a lot of trouble breathing. And I wound up having to preach every service of our little camp meeting. Every one of my friends, everyone I'd invited, called out. Can't come. Sorry, brother. Can't make it. It's like, Lord, you sure don't make it easy on a guy, do you? Honey, the worse it gets, the bigger the miracle you need. Amen. Thank God we serve a God who's in the business of big miracles. Hallelujah. Amen. Finally, one day, my best friend who lived with me and helped me and was part of our church, Jose, he and I had gone grocery shopping and we bought a few things. I didn't have a car at the moment. And so we come home and we were carrying these bags of groceries and we lived in a third floor walk-up apartment. I walked up the two flights of stairs to get to the third floor and uh, my apartment was actually two levels so you had to walk up two flights of stairs to get to the third floor and then my apartment was the third and fourth floor it, it included both so I turned around and I got to into my apartment and I was facing the stairs to go up the last bit to our kitchen to my kitchen and I fell down on the floor and I was gasping for air I was having a horrible time. I couldn't breathe. And my friend Jose looked at me and said, you want me to call an ambulance? And I was struggling to breathe. But I said, no, because I knew if he called an ambulance, Rose, I was going to wind up back in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And Sunday was just the next day. Mm -hmm. I said, I might as well wait till t after tomorrow to go to the hospital. Tommy's looking at me with that look that he always gives me. You <laughs> stubborn mule, you. <laughs> He and I have been down this path a time or two in the past as well. I said, no. I said, we got church tomorrow. Let me get through church tomorrow. Then so I called. They had a visiting nurse after the 
after the uh, third or second hospitalization that summer, they had a visiting nurse come into the house to do to check on me, you know, and to check my blood pressure and all this. Yeah. And she had actually come the, the the I think the day before that I fell out. And uh, I told her, I said, I've got pneumonia starting. And she listened to my lungs and stuff. Said, oh, no, your lungs sound good. I said, no, they don't. I said, I have pneumonia. See, I know what pneumonia feels like. Mm -hmm. I've had pneumonia on several occasions. And believe me, when I have pneumonia started, Tommy can tell you, mm -hmm. I've gone to the hospital and told the doctors I have the beginnings of pneumonia. And they come back and said, you're right, you have the beginnings of pneumonia. I can tell. And I told this nurse, and she didn't believe me. She thought, no, she listened to my lungs. Well, the next day when I fell out and all that and couldn't breathe, when I finally was able to catch my breath and all, I went up to bed, and I called the visiting nurse, and I told her what happened. She said, Charles, maybe you are having lung trouble. said, you need to call an ambulance and get to the hospital immediately. I said, no, I've got church tomorrow. said, I'll wait till Monday. I said, Monday morning I'll drive myself to the doctor. That's what I did. I had church Sunday. Monday morning, I drove myself to the doctor. The doctor was right across the street from Yelma Haven Hospital. He had credentials with Yelma Haven Hospital. He sent me across the way to get a chest x-ray. Before they could even send me for a chest x-ray, my blood, my blood oxygen level was so low, they had to put me on oxygen before they could even send me for an x-ray. He sent me for an x-ray, and I come back. And a few minutes later, he comes in and he said, Charles, you're not going to like what I have to say. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. Anybody of you that have heard me tell this story know I tell it the same exact way every single time because this is exactly how it happened. And I looked at him and I said, well, you make it sound so dire. That was my exact words. And he looked at me and he said, it is. You may die. He said, your lungs are so full of fluid that I don't even know how you're able to be conscious right now. He said, I honestly don't know how you're even able to talk to me right now. So I have to admit you. I said, okay. So they sent me across the street to Yellow Haven Hospital. They admitted me within an hour. I was unconscious. I woke up days later, my mother by my bedside, which shocked me, surprised me. She was living with my stepdad down here in Texas, so for her to be in Connecticut came as quite a surprise to me. And uh, I woke up and I could not speak. My hands were tethered to the sides of the bed. I had intubation down my throat. I was hooked up to a breathing machine. They said I could not breathe if it weren't for this machine. It would be impossible for me to breathe. I was on that machine about a week and they said there really hadn't been much improvement but we have to get the intubation out because it's not good to have intubation through your throat long term. And they said we have to get it out. We want to see if maybe you can support your own breathing and we'll just put you on oxygen. They took out the tube. Never forget it as long as I live. If you've never been through this, you don't know what a nightmare it is. And they pulled those tubes out of my throat, you know, long tubes, because they go all the way down into your lungs. And I'm sitting there, and, and Bill, I'm struggling to breathe. I'm trying. And they keep saying, breathe, breathe. And I'm going, and I'm trying to breathe. And I could not get oxygen in my lungs. I could get nothing, nothing. I felt like I was drowning. And I, I remember just being in sheer terror. And I thought to myself, are these fools going to let me die? Are they going to let me sit here and drown and die? Because they weren't doing anything. And next thing you know, of course, I blacked out. And when I came to again, I had been reintubated. And they told me later, they said, one of the last things in the world we ever want to do is take the intubation out of somebody's throat and then have to turn around and re-intubate them again through the throat. But I was literally suffocating and I didn't have time for them to do a tracheotomy. They had to do it through the throat a second time. Another nearly two weeks pass. 
or so, and the doctors are telling my aunt, they've been telling my family I'd be dead within 24 hours. That's what they kept telling my mother. He'll be gone probably within 24 hours. They told her that for a month. Can you imagine for a month thinking that every time the phone rang, you were getting a call to say your son had died? That's what my mother said she went through. And boy, I'm telling you, I went through hell on that bed, Rose. I hallucinated, I saw things, I experienced things. I felt anxiety and fear like I've never felt before because the drugs they put you on put you through hell. Ativan is one drug they use, and Ativan causes this sense of anxiety in you that I can't even describe. It's the most horrible, horrible, hideous anxiety that you could ever experience. Your whole body is shaking on the inside. You're just, you know, like a... It's horrible. I told my mother I couldn't speak, but they had finally, they had un, unhooked my arms from the bed. They said, you promise you're not going to try to pull out the hoses and stuff, and I said, you shook my head, yes. I couldn't have pulled them out if I wanted to. Honestly, I didn't have the strength to do anything. They give me a pad of paper and some crayons to write messages to my mother. And I told my mother, I said, I don't think I'm going to live to see my 35th birthday, which is just a few days away. And my mother said, don't say that. I said, I don't think I'm going to live. Then, One day I'm laying there on the bed and I'm trying to think if it was the day after my birthday or something to that effect. I wound up living to my birthday. The doctors brought in a little cupcake for me. They had a candle on it, but they couldn't light it, obviously, with all the oxygen and everything in my yeah. room. It had gone up like a you know, zeppelin. But anyway, they sang happy birthday to me. The doctors were all amazed I lived literally to see my birthday. And a room full of nurses and doctors sang happy birthday to me. And then my mother came in and she said, I've got an envelope here. She said, I, I was on your computer and I saw your friend Ronnie Pig. He's a pastor of a church like ours. Uh, used to be in, in Arizona. He's retired now, but he used to be in Phoenix. And she said, I saw his name in your contact, she said, and I remembered you talking about him. So I sent him an email and told him what was happening and told him we needed prayer for you. And she said, well, he sent this overnight express mail, FedEx. And it was an envelope, you know, and I could feel it and I knew immediately what it was. I said, they prayed over a hanky and they anointed a hanky, a prayer cloth, and they sent it to me. Well, I couldn't open the envelope. That's how weak I was. I could not open a FedEx envelope. My mother unzipped it for me and everything, and I, I pulled out a piece of paper. It was a letter Ronnie had written. I handed it to my mother, and she read it to me. And basically, Ronnie said something to the effect, Brother, don't go anywhere. We need you in this movement. I said, Our church prayed over this prayer cloth for you, and we're believing God for a miracle. And then I reached in that envelope and I could feel that prayer cloth. <coughs> and I knew. <laughs> I knew what it was. I knew, I knew what it represents. Somebody was exercising faith on my behalf. Somebody was believing God for a miracle on my behalf. And when I felt that prayer cloth, I remember I literally said to the Lord, I said, Lord, they're believing you for a miracle. And I'll be hanged if I'm going to make you look like a liar. I said, Lord, if they're believing you for a miracle, then I'm going to believe you for a miracle. And my exact words in my mind, because I couldn't talk, I was intubated, <laughs> my exact words were, let's get this done. That was the exact words that I thought. They're believing you for a miracle, I'm believing you for a miracle. Let's get this done. I'm not going to go through the whole story. The next day, they came in and said, something is happening in, in your body. We can't explain it. Said, but we're going to take the intubation out, and we're going to see if you can breathe now. And they took the intubation out. I could support my own breathing, and I began to recover from the very next day after receiving that prayer cloth. Oh, I want to tell you, God could have healed me while I was sick. Turned out I had a parasite. 
in my intestine that I got while I was in Europe. It's not a parasite that is native to uh, Americas. So therefore, it was so small and so minute that the doctors in New York City couldn't see it. When they would examine my feces and what have you, they could not see evidence of this parasite. When I moved to Connecticut, Yale New Haven Hospital had a microscope that was capable of seeing this parasite. Had I not moved, I'd have died in New York City. But I moved to Connecticut, they were able to see the parasite, they began to treat me for the parasite, but then I developed double pneumonia. Mm. So when I went in the hospital, I was still being treated for the parasite, and I was suffering from double pneumonia. But God gave me a miracle. I'm here today, 21 years later, hallelujah, because God gave me a miracle. i got news for you today, children. It's never too late for a miracle. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness. Listen, in Matthew 19, verse 26, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Amen. Oh, folks, I want you to understand today as I close, the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, might have preferred the Lord's had rescued them from Babylon and delivered them to a place of safety and comfort rather than their having to go through the fiery furnace. Mm -hmm. But while that may have taken a miracle, it was nothing in comparison to the miracle God performed in allowing them to pass through the fire and emerge alive and victorious without so much as the smell of smoke upon their clothing. The same might be said of Daniel. Surely he would have preferred the angel of the Lord had come and led him by the hand out of prison as the angel of the Lord would later do for Peter in the New Testament. But where would the miracle have been in that? Was it not better that he be able to testify to the king and, excuse me, to the king that his God had preserved him even in the face of ravenous lions? Sometimes as God's people, we're called upon to wait. We must wait for a reason. We must wait for a better testimony, a bigger miracle. No matter how long it may seem we are waiting, the truth today is simply this. It is never too late for a miracle. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.